You ready for me? Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned that the, the building up of LIGO wasn't done by any of the strategic planning. There was no yellow bar that was defined by somebody else or R&D funds at the labs. It was done by, in a much more entrepreneurial way by Kip and others. And that brought it to the point where I'll, I'll, the details in between kind of turning it into a construction project from R&D and who you convince and all that, I'll leave that for Kip. Then at some point it gets to be a construction project and uh, I, what I want to do is not give you a cookbook for how you organize a construction project, but more interesting is kind of just the general features and the puzzle then of how you get from that to a re research environment thing because some things are quite orthogonal. In terms of kind of the organizational structure that you talk about when you make an organization, people talk about flat organizations and vertical organizations. What does that mean? A vertical organization is one that has uh, uh, basically reporting above at every level and it slowly comes to the boss at the top. So that's a total vertical organization and it's, it has every task broken down at some level. You know, it moves down at some level. And every task has a budget, has a budget manager, who you report to, has deliverables, something you build or make or calculate and hand off. And uh, you're judged by whether you did it within your budget, time, and so forth, and then it all comes together. That's the most traditional way you build any construction, typical construction project. You know, if you build a bridge, that's what you do. That's the, just, the, you build a building, you build uh, an airplane, that's the, scheme that's used, the amount of extra things in an airplane compared to a bridge have to do with integration and quality control. Those are the added features that are kind of outside that you have to do, in a, certainly for a science project. Uh, but the basic kind of guts of the organization is something that's vertical and everybody and everything has a, has a budget, a box, a person in charge you know, people that work for them, and then they report and deadlines and so forth and so on. And that's what works. That's what's been built. That's what's built almost everything you look at outside the door and so forth. So you want to be as close as that as you can. I mean, we're clever as scientists, but um, it takes guts to feel you're going to do something different from kind of what works and make all the things happen, the right budget, the uh, the, the fact that you have to deliver things, the reportability, and so forth and so on. So you want it to look this way, but the research environment that I talked about, if you actually talked about it in organizational terms, is what you call a flat organization. It isn't vertical at all. You decide in the morning which lab you go into, nobody's reporting to somebody every day, there's not, there's not the hierarchy, and so forth and so on. So you want it to be, it's never completely flat, but a real research organization is as kind of as flat as you can do. So everybody's a colleague and you go next door and you decide what you do and so forth. So that's the pure thing. So it's not so simple to think how you build something like this and end up with something like this. And it's the, it's the uh, uh, trickiest uh, part. For us in LIGO, we have a very flat organization at this point. We have separate groups operating each of them, like these small laboratories I talked about at the beginning, they have a few people, no more than in a small lab, and they do different projects. On campus, we have the 40 meter. It's being run by Alan Weinstein, and there's a postdoc, and a few students, and technician. We have the, the uh, a, what's called the thermal noise interferometer, uh, Eric Black, and uh, I don't know how many people do you have, Eric, over there, three or four? three total, including a, a grad student. We have other advanced R&D projects that are all that size. Uh, data analysis is a little trickier. I'll come to that because there's a certain amount of it that requires larger infrastructure to be able to do it. And it has to do with not the data analysis itself necessarily requires it, but the amount of data that you have and the amount of computing facilities that you have uh, require a certain amount of organization. So data analysis is an area that's a little bit hybrid. You'd like to keep it as much like these as possible, 
And it's tricky to figure out how to do that exactly and have all the common infrastructure and reliability that you need. Uh, and then if in a flat organization, I'm going back and forth between these two, but in a flat organization, uh, like we are in now, is it's a research project, you want to be able to do new projects. So when we talk about advanced LIGO, now you're in the wrong organization. You're building advanced LIGO and you've created a flat organization, so you have to take a piece of it and make it look like that. So that's a little tricky. And lastly, uh, as you turn this thing into a research organization, I talked about open data for NASA. Our scheme for having, including the broader community, is to create a very large and open collaboration so that people join LIGO itself, what we call the LIGO scientific collaboration, and they have their data access through that, but then they abide by the same guidelines and rules that that group does. They have peer review inside. I mentioned that these collaborations have their own peer review and so forth, which gives reliability and uh, a little better chance that people won't do stupid things and say stupid things and so forth. And so we've chosen to have the open data access through uh, uh, people joining this collaboration. The collaboration for LIGO to build the construction project with Caltech and MIT involve, involves about uh, less than 50 scientists, maybe 40, something like that, scientists. and. Uh, uh, that's what was needed to build the basic instrument and do some of the R&D that we're talking about. The LIGO scientific community, as it's grown to do this, I don't know what the latest numbers are, but it's over 300 uh, scientists from about five countries or six countries and uh, maybe about 25, in 25 identifiable separate groups or institutions. So, so that's this open, open part. Uh, the other thing about what we're doing compared to, say, the NASA model, when we built this vertically, is that every piece of these, I talked about all these boxes in a, some vertical organization like building a bridge, but key to us being able to make sure we had the quality and the demands that we have inside LIGO was to make sure that each of these boxes had a responsible scientist, so that the project at all levels was guided by scientists, not by uh, just uh, engineers. It's not just that scientists are smarter, uh, but there's an investment in the product. We're the ones that have to use it. We're the ones that have to uh, know, not just know the best, but we're the ones that have the investment and have to live with it afterwards. As good an engineer as you might hire to do this, he goes on to another engineering job when he finishes it. As I recall, the scientists weren't necessarily the bosses. No, no. No, we, in some cases, the scientists are the bosses, and in some cases, the scientists were uh, basically side by side with the task manager who was more able to do the, the, that thing. So we had something we called a liaison scientist, something like that. I forget the name we used. OK, just to give you a feeling of what these things look like, I'm not going to go through this, but we, this is a, an old one. I just grabbed it. I covered up the date. It's even got our old logo. But these are the kind of schedules that you make when you build this. This, this was uh, approved in 1994, and we made a schedule that went out through 201, but it's got all the pieces, you know, all the equipment that you build, vacuum equipment, beam tubes, and so forth, the period of design, the period of construction, the period of installation, the whole thing designed to where it comes together so that you bring it together in ways that the experts can work on different things at different times. And uh, these are the two different sites for the two different LIGO uh, pieces. So those are typical high-level, what we call a summary schedule. We call it an integrated schedule because it has the whole project together. And then this is where the accountability, this is a typical accountability uh, uh, graph. The trick here is to ensure success a little bit like these performance metrics when you when you're contracted to do this is to make a a list that satisfies somebody that they're there are all the things you really want to do and also ones that you feel confident that you're not going to get embarrassed by so we made a whole list of of uh, of this is for the facilities and there's another piece of it for detectors so we had two lists 
just a finite number, over a period of uh, six years, uh, about a dozen uh, what we call milestones, things that had to be completed at a certain time. You know, when do you occupy the buildings? And you can look at what's in what we call the PMP, that was the project management plan. It's the thing that had to be approved before they would give us any money. So we had to write this down before they give us any money. And you can compare all those dates with when we actually uh, uh, finished these. These were all finished. And they're, they're all within a month or so the same for six years. So we managed to succeed because we defined our success properly. And the same thing for the detector. So there's a whole bunch of milestones that bring you up to coincidences. Money. You can also plot how you spent the money. This project costs almost $300 million. And how do you determine how much it costs? Let me just say a few words uh, about how that's done. And, and I'll talk about another word that you hear, and then you'll see the philosophy that we used for something called contingency. So uh, it's important, of course, to spend, uh, to, to estimate properly the cost of, of a project. How do you do that? You, you could do it, you know, if you do something kind of at, at home and you build something, you just kind of guess at it and you add something and, and uh, build it. And here the stakes are a little bit higher, so you have to try to do a little bit different discipline. So what we do, what we did is take, and this is not just us, but the scheme sometimes is different, but the scheme I'll give you is the one that we use. So we create this vertical thing with all these boxes, and then we go down to absolutely the lowest level possible, and whatever widgets there are, or pieces you need to put together, as defined as they are, and some of them are better defined than others. And we take each one and we ask what it costs, for, and not allowing ourselves to do anything other than give the best estimate we possibly can. No fudge factors. So you get the best estimate you possibly can on the numbers at the very bottom. And those numbers then are added up, and in our case came to something like, uh, I'll show you the final thing, but I think it was something like 200 and 40 or 250 million out of 290 uh, out of a budget of 292 so 240 some million dollars was just going absolutely to identifying everything and you're really where you mess up there is the things you forget or things that you really somehow misidentify or misdesign things that you just have to redo completely but otherwise that should be pretty good if you've designed it and you know all the all the pieces, you should be able to get those pretty much right. This includes salaries, I presume. Yeah, includes salaries. And you do it in today's dollars. So you do it all in today's dollars, then you estimate something about inflation in the in the in the budgeting. So then you end up with two hundred and fifty million dollars. Then what do you do to take care of the rest? What is contingency? The idea of contingency is that things don't cost what you estimate if you're as honest as you can be. But instead, they're going to cost somewhat more. But the amount more depends on what it is. So what, what we do is go to this very lowest level and uh, uh, take every item then, whether it's you know something you can go out and buy or something that's in Kip's head. And we basically assign a contingency. And the contingency that we used, I don't remember exactly, was something like uh, 4% on anything you can find in a catalog because maybe by the time you buy it, it's that, or it's gone up a little bit. So anything you buy in the catalog is 4%. Anything that we have some preliminary bids, preliminary bids, you have to realize, are never the same as what somebody will actually sell you something for. That's when you go to some company and ask them, what will they do this for? And they come back. And so you assign, we assigned, I don't know, 10, 10 or 12% to that. So any item that was uh, that we had some sort of piece of paper that said some company had looked at it or somebody had looked at it, we designed 10 or 12 percent. And then anything that uh, an engineer actually did a design, detailed design, uh, was uh, I forget 22 percent. And um, anything that was uh, uh, not engineered, meaning it was a in Kip's head or a notional design, if you want, of a physicist. In order not to embarrass this entitled, entirely, we assigned 98%, not 100%. So it's 98%. Those numbers come about from some history. 
I, I knew that you used those numbers because it was the way I had done things in high energy physics where there's been enough previous projects so that we know how well these contingency numbers, I oversimplified it a little bit in telling you, but we know how well they've worked over a, a series of projects. So, so you have the best reliable estimate of uh, what all the widgets cost. You have the best possible uh, estimate by knowing how those items are well known and kind of how much contingency. You add all that up, and so we ended up with something like 20% contingency that you needed, which meant most of ours was typically at the level of an engineering design, not a catalog thing that you bought, and also not just totally notional. Then, yeah, I, I see the red code going down. What do you see? Oh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll explain that. Why would it go down? I'll show you. I'll, I'll tell you. So this, this graph here is the integrated spending, which should never go down, right? So we see it go down here. Uh, the integrated spending, uh, this, this graph here is, the, is when we got the funding. So this is the funding. The funding should always be to the left of what you spend or you've uh, spent in advance. In our case, we are very fortunate that the funding always preceded the need. Sometimes it doesn't, and then you have to slow things down and wait for funding or borrow or something. This graph here is our design to spend it. And at some points, we made some corrections. We decided to reduce some scope somewhere because we wanted to make sure that we didn't exceed this up here. So there's some knobs you can turn along the way. So these are kind of these little management decisions that I have to make along the way. And you can see I didn't bother with them very early. But uh, w uh, when it got closer, we decided to you know, not put some rug on a floor and somewhere, some, you know, some sort of things that there you could make choices and to make sure that it would be all right, and then add them at the very end. And I'll show you how you do that. So that's a knob you have. And then how you spend this contingency is the other knob. And I, they, I'm not going to show this because I want to get on to our status in a minute. Let me just show contingency. So this is then monitoring what happens to the contingency as a function of time. The first thing that happens is we made it grow a little bit. So we got a contingency by what uh, the methodology that I said, and then we added to it. How do we do that? We took some things out of the project, like I said, right at the beginning. You know, fancy rugs or size of a building or something. We decided we wanted a little more safety, things that we could add later. And we build it up by, it doesn't look like much on this plot, but it's $3 million. So we added $3 million in contingency at the beginning. And at various points along the way, we did a similar thing. We built up the contingency by deciding not to do something. That there were some choices. And then basically watch this thing and so that you basically want to get so that this is the amount of money that you have left that isn't committed and you want to get to where you exactly spend the last dollar on the last day and you don't have to give a penny back to the government and you don't overspend anything. And that's just a, a tuning job right at the end just to bring this down. And we're still doing this very last piece. And the very last piece is easy for us because what we deferred to the very end is $3 million worth of computers. And of course, the later you buy those, the better computing you get. And if you buy 2.9 million instead of three, it doesn't much matter. So it's easy for us to, to bring this right down to the last dollar and we won't have to give a penny back. And we're, and we're heroes because we did it all right. Right, it's, it's a strange incentive structure though, right? Because the incentive is to spend every penny, whereas if this were a you know, matter of product, and Right. Yes. As a business organization, you might be rewarded. You might get a bonus at the end if you came in. Right, right. But in fact, some of the incentives are really bad here because if, these, if this job was done by, look, the incentive for me in doing it is to get the most performance out I can when this goes to zero. The incentive, if you're, uh, there's some projects now done on accelerators that I'm familiar with and I won't name them, where this little bump here went way up. And what, what they do is an engineer takes control of the project, and then he's fine as long as this thing doesn't overspend. And so he wants to take a lot of money and build himself a big reserve. But he affects the physics performance. or the, the So you, you almost need a scientist that cares in the end, because what you're really trying to do is to answer your question is get as much of the product that you want scientifically. So I got rid of rugs, but not... Uh, performance kind of that was the idea but you're right it's uh, it's a funny thing
But anyway, that's how it's done. Uh, this is just to show you how many people are involved. So there's about 150 people. These are all the different, how many engineers, how many are Caltech students and all that stuff. But there's about 150 people involved in something like LIGO at Caltech and, and uh, MIT and the two sites. And uh, these, this is a fraction of them working on the construction project, rolling over to that different organization. The yellow here is the operations. And so as we rolled over into that, this organization was the one that's flat, and this is the one that one, one was vertical. They overlapped each other, and so it was kind of how you, how you made that all mesh. And at this point, we're this totally research-oriented, flat organization uh, trying to turn this on. So let me spend 20 minutes giving you a really quick view of, of LIGO itself and its status. But first, are there any more questions on the organization? I took a little longer than I intended because I went broader than LIGO, but that's big science. That's how big science is done. Okay, so we started construction on LIGO. We got the first funding in 1994, and I showed you some graphs there where we basically did the construction and finished almost all the civil construction and spent almost all the construction money by 2000. Some of it's held back purposely, like the uh, uh, money for computers because why spend a penny before you need to use the computer for something you get better computing so we've held back that and a few other things like some lab space and lab buildings that we want to tune to the last dollar if we can have them then we want a uh, clean lab or this or that so basically but the instrument itself is, has been the money in the device itself has been spent and we've got what we've got this is the Hanford facility it's in uh, western, in eastern Washington, high desert, flat, mountains in the background, very stable. It's on kind of sandy surface, but very, very, very stable. And uh, this is the four kilometer arms going out to here. And this is the central building, which is about uh, 50,000 square feet and uh, contains the business end of the, the, the lasers, the the central optics that split the beams and so forth, they're all in this building. And then our office and lab buildings out here. And then we've built a second lab building somewhere near there. They're separated by, the two LIGO sites are separated by 3,000 kilometers. That means that, the, that a signal from anything in the universe can differ by a total of uh, plus or minus 10 milliseconds depending on whether it's coming that way, that way, or straight down. So basically, in comparing the two, we asked for the signals to be uh, coincident to something of the order of plus or minus 10 milliseconds. And the idea of that is kind of illustrated here. If we have, we have actually two sites, but we have three interferometers. It was, it's straightforward to put one extra interferometer it's not 100% independent. It's inside the same vacuum system. And it was chosen to be half the length of the uh, four kilometers. So in Hanford, we have one two kilometer and one four kilometer interferometer. The two kilometer interferometer then for a gravitational wave signal should give half the size signal of the four kilometer interferometer. But for a lot of common noise, that's just in the sites, they'll give the same size signals. That was the idea between the behind the two. The reason is that locally, you can lower the rate of just funny things that happen by asking for the coincidence. And then the coincidence between the two sites is easier to do. So there's three interferometers, but that's the strategy. Going to the uh, previous history of having done a test on the 40 meter here, we had a pretty good indication of what the noise, you've, you've heard a lot about noise over the last few weeks, but what the no, how Gaussian the noise is. And once the, once the noise is non-Gaussian, you get a very long tail, raising the threshold quickly loses sensitivity. So if you went to a reasonable level where you started to be in the non-Gaussian tail of the interferometer here on campus, the rate was about 50 per hour that it just gave uh, in a, in a power, excess power above that level, okay? 
That, we felt, was an upper limit on what a real interferometer would give because the environment here is not very good compared to the quiet environment, say, at Hanford or in Livingston. And so that's an upper limit. But we more or less knew how much common noise there was and how that would reduce things by doing a local coincidence and then a coincidence between the sites. The idea being that by the time you get the triple coincidence, you should have a false rate that's low compared to the event rate, or at least our patients, so that we had a goal of less than one per 10 years. So, so these are the considerations. Those are the considerations. The 90s, yeah. The were made about right. The strategy. Right. So that, that's the strategy. Uh, a second piece of just information, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data if, I, uh, if we get a chance, is that the, uh, the data recording, in contrast to a particle physics experiment, which is always triggered, you always have an interaction and a trigger somehow that you can form, you can keep, although particle physics experiments have a huge amount of data, they have the advantage that you can have a trigger, you can select how selective the trigger is. Here, we just take a time frequency series. And if you take the time frequency series, you get a huge amount of data. The amount of data in the gravitational wave signal uh, is not the major contributor, but it's fairly big. It's about uh, uh, 0.2 megabytes per second. And the total amount of data is far greater than that because we register a lot of things about the servos. We register a lot of things about uh, auxiliary signals, environmental signals, so forth and so on. And we're not sure a priori till we start looking for signals, which ones of those are important and which ones aren't. So we're reluctant to throw any of that away. So we end up with 16 megabytes per second of data. And that quickly adds up to a lot of data. So the, the short engineering run that we recently had in early January uh, had something like 13 terabytes of data. And that was just a little test run. That's already enough so that it's hard to get your arms around it. That's a lot of data. Uh, we do data analysis both online and offline. By online, what we mean is either directly in the control room, where people get signals and they can maybe affect the instrument, or something that's done uh, from the amount of data that we store locally on the disk quickly enough to give information back, maybe not directly online, but the next shift or next hour or next time somebody uh, who is an expert sees something in the data to give back to the, uh, uh, to the operators. We also then can use uh, that for diagnostics, and we can do a certain amount of data compression. And the offline data is analyzed by putting it first in an archive, and we use the HPSS system uh, in CACR here and have built our own archive over there. Uh, OK. So uh, let's see where we are. We started. By the time we kind of got the money and then got ourselves organized, we started. This is a this is a uh, graph that I've used since 1994 with the with the agencies and reporting to them to just give them the absolute simplest highlight. What is the main thing we're doing each year, and with maybe a comment. So we started by, of course, clearing the sites and doing civil stuff. We've worked our way toward uh, finishing building it in 2000, getting the the interferometer themselves working and now just beginning on uh, sensitivity studies. So that's where we are now. And I'll show you that just quickly. And uh, uh, we expect to start our first really serious science run about summer of 2003 next year. OK, I'm going to skip uh, several of these or show you quickly. but. Uh, the, there's a few features. The, this is a cross-section of the LIGO beam tube. It is an absolutely minimal thing. This is a beam tube. I've worked around accelerators my whole life. This is much more minimal. There's no services. So there's no electricity down it. It's just a shield to cover the beam pipe. The beam pipe itself is very large. It's 1.2 meter in diameter, thin stainless steel, 3 millimeter stainless steel. And it's big because it's our whole laboratory. So the whole laboratory is under vacuum. And uh, it's at high vacuum, as you've probably seen in the noise curves. I'm not, I'm not sure I have one. So it, this is what it looks like. It was made by a spiral a mill that we made ourselves, or had made by industry. But 
it, you basically take a huge roll of stainless steel, three millimeter stainless steel, rolled up like a like a roll of toilet paper, only as big as this here, and you unroll it in a way that just spirals out and makes uh, makes the tube. So you're seeing the spiral here with stiffening rings to keep it stiff. Otherwise, it's like a piece of spaghetti. And that whole thing had uh, 50 kilometers of well. And by being very careful, because we were absolutely fearful we'd have leaks and couldn't find them, the classical way in the small physics lab is you helium bag something. You can't helium bag this. So uh, we ended up with no leaks, which luck luckily, we thought we had ways to trace it, but uh, they didn't. This is just an example. If we used a standard uh, vacuum on this huge vacuum system, just pump it down, you get to something like 10 to the minus 6 torr. And the sensitivity curves that you looked at are kind of here in a crude form. And that's pretty close. And in our scheme where we're going to move down further as we improve LIGO, we want to keep all the secondary noise sources, the ones that aren't the primary ones up here, away from us. And so we couldn't just do this. So we had to create a high vacuum system out of this huge vacuum system. And you do that by baking out, by very clean, having it very clean and baking the whole thing out, which is a big process. That brings this background level lurking here down to this level here. And that's just an example of several things. This we did by borrowing magnet power supplies from Fermilab, uh, running a current down the stainless steel, heating it up to 100, 160 degrees C, and letting it bake for about, uh, well, putting house insulation around it, letting it bake so it's very uniform, and then letting it bake for about a week. And that's the equivalent of a century or so of just outgassing otherwise. So you, you accelerate the outgassing. And then they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the end of it, you get to where you've improved things by three orders of magnitude. And, oh, and, the power bill for the bake oh, the power bill was high. It was more than, it's hard to just, there's no power meter on that itself, but it was more than $100,000 per site just to bake it out. These are the big vacuum chambers. And what to notice is they're about 15 feet high or so. And there's a lot of ports. That's because there's a lot of different access and different side beams and alignment things and so forth that you want to have. Uh, they are under uh, high vacuum also. But what's on the ends of each are this thing here. See the thing here and here? These are, are gate valves, larger than you can buy commercially. They're four foot gate valves. And they close off this long vacuum. So once we make the long vacuum, which works at 10 to the minus 9 torr, we never change that. That stays baked out. If we want to work on a mirror or something in here, you close these gate valves, keep the long arms under high vacuum, and go inside the chamber and work on it. It all, all has to be done clean, but that's the scheme. This is inside that big building in the corner. This is just a more detailed view but of the fact that what makes these tricky, other than the fact that it's optical tables, very clean, and so forth, is that this kind of seismic system that you heard about has to be inside this vacuum and uh, has to perform under, under, under uh, vacuum and not out gas and ruin the vacuum and so forth. Uh, let me not go through those. You've heard those things separately. So let me. Uh, uh, go on a little bit. Uh, we, it, from the, I'm just going to do a few highlights. From the uh, 40 meter studies, we have been able to test our ability to model these noise sources. This is a detailed model of the noise sources that has been done within LIGO, projecting from the real data observed in the 40 meter and calculations of some of them that are lower and projecting what the sensitivity will be in LIGO itself. So the projected sensitivity comes from a model that has a reasonable amount of testing in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the prototype. And so that's how you develop a model to, to do things. Uh, the optics in LIGO is actually very impressive uh, for, for uh, uh, it's the same quality, more or less, that people use in optical telescopes. Uh, Lambda over 5,000 is achieved in these mirrors. They're quite big. The reason they're big is that the, uh, 
laser beam, of course, bounces back and forth some, but we want to contain the large, uh, the large uh, tails on any, any of the uh, optics. They're 25 centimeters across, 10 centimeters thick. And uh, this is, then we map each of them. The idea eventually being that the mapping of the surface is included in the simulation program so that the detailed simulation program actually knows uh, the details of the mirrors that it goes through. Uh, these mirrors, since you go into it and if you pass through the mirrors, also have to be optically transparent, not heat up too much and so forth. So they have very low absorption, very low scattering and so forth. Uh, you have to work clean around all these things, and they have to be—they have to have the feature that their whatever inherent uh, noise they have, thermal noise, whatever noise, we can keep it out of our frequency band. And so they have what's called high Q. These are the Qs as measured for some of these uh, mirrors. Uh, the laser we have has to be a. Did you have you heard of, talked about the lasers? Okay, the laser itself that we use is a single line laser and it's a continuous laser. It was developed at Stanford by some of our collaborators and was uh, developed far enough so we were able, and this is something that you'd like to point for in experimental work, is we could commercialize it. We managed to be able to talk a company or get a company to build it for us, which means not only that they service it, but they make it reliably, they've turned it into something in their catalog, and the last thing we want to worry about is the performance of our laser. I mean, we want to worry about LIGO noise sources, not the laser itself. We want it to be really, really reliable. We've used that laser for a lot, long time now. I'll show you a little bit. No, maybe I won't. Uh, I want to show you locking, since you've seen locking in a film, to show you what it looks, what it looks like in a control room. Uh, let me skip this. Okay, in turning on the machine, I'm just gonna show you two things. I'm gonna show you what happens in practice turning it on in the control room. First thing is the laser. I just showed you the laser. Uh, when we turned on the laser, it looked like this is a noise, this is just uh, the frequency noise in the laser versus frequency. This curve up here is what it looked like when we turned it on. It's actually run for something like 20,000 hours continuously and not broken. So the first requirement that we had it done in industry was a good idea. Uh, and then we take this, and this is typical of any sub-piece of a big complicated piece of equipment like this, is measure its performance against what you want it to be. This is what was used in those performance curves. And then work on the reasons why it's different than that and bring it down. This graph is a little old but because it's better now. But this is in the kind of improvements that you get just working on it. And I'm only using it as an illustration that what you do is work on any of these sub pieces and make it work. And you also work on the overall performance of the whole system of LIGO. And eventually this comes down. I think this now is at its design performance, except for a couple humps at low, lower frequency. Okay, I want to show you the locking because you, you had Matt Evans talk and he probably showed you more matrices and so forth. And I, I'm going to show you what happens if you're in the control room uh, in locking the interferometer. By locking, of course, what we mean is that we achieve a resonant uh, state, that these are Fabry-Perot arms and we get them to resonate, the light to resonate and build up in the arms and build up even further when we put in a recycling, uh, a recycling mirror. Experiments with what's being locked to what? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the uh, first thing we do is start with a laser and it gets locked in steps. You, you basically start with a laser, it's the thing you stabilize. And you, everything refers back to that and has feedback back to that. And step by step you stabilize it. It first goes through a mode plane or a thing that, that stabilizes it and picks the, the central frequency. And then you bring it into a, what we call a central Michelson that you get stabilized, and you add one arm at a time and, and reference it back to that. When you say stabilized, what, what, what exactly is stable? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is just an example, for example, going back of the stabilization of the laser itself. If you just take the laser itself that comes out of its box, it has a certain stability. 
Then we have a requirement that we have feedback loops to make it stable more. And so we build a lot of electronics that just looks at the laser itself and feeds it back without going into any details. This is the frequency. So, so this is the fre so what I'm going to show you is the frequency of the laser itself after we go through our electronics is stable to 10 to the minus 1 hertz per root hertz. Okay? Then we add a next step, which is kind of preparing it to go into the interferometer, if you want, what we call input optics. That actually stabilizes it further. Then when we go in the interferometer and make the interferometer work, it stabilizes it yet further. Okay, so yeah, that you heard. Yeah, and you can see it stabilized in steps. Okay, so by the time we make the whole interferometer work, we can go back and look very carefully at the laser, and that's what I was showing you before. So I had skipped a couple steps. When I show you this, this is afterwards. So what I want to show you is this uh, locking itself, or what you see if you're actually in the control room. And I, and I like this particular picture because it's before it was very stable, so you can kind of see the features. And it was the time when we first began to lock it, so it wasn't really very stable. Now it's kind of uninteresting to see. It's either locked or something's wrong. Uh, so we lock first. First we do these steps in here and make all this work, and then eventually try to bring up uh, a arm into resonance, and, or the other arm into resonance, so, and then finally both arms. So what I'm going to show you is a little video that shows the uh, a scattered signal from this uh, recycling mirror, from the splitter mirror, and from the two end mirrors. And let me just say a few words before you see it. Uh, the size of the images is the magnification of the camera, nothing to do with the size of the image, the size of the beam itself. Second thing is the images are white on a dark background. So as they get, as the resonance um, uh, luminosity of the beam builds up, you don't see a whiter image, you see the background get blacker. So that's the two things to keep in mind. So you, as it builds up, you'll see the background get blacker. So what I'm going to show you is one of our first, what at that time was a long uh, a lock, because it shows you then the other controls you have to use uh, using those cameras. So this locked for a couple minutes. Well, first I do, do one arm. So this is, this is these two images. And notice the waving around. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then this one arm is locked. So it, we are able quickly to do uh, one arm locking. This waving around is really the fact that at that time we didn't have stabilization in yaw and pitch. And so these are actually the mirrors moving around. If they move enough, then the whole thing goes out of lock. Okay, now I'll go to, to trying to lock the whole thing. Yeah. So what, what about the amplitude of the movement? The amplitude in order to, to lock has to be less than 10 to the minus 10 meters in order to have a chance to lock. The actual amplitude that we're measuring here is, it, to see this, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but it's probably one or two orders of magnitude lower than that. Maybe 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus 12 meters, yeah. But they're slow in time, see it went out of, out of lock here. Uh, now I'm gonna show both arms locking, and you'll see it's trying to, remember it's just waving back and forth and it has to try to catch it in the way that Matt Evans talked about. And you'll see one arm lock, and when the second one locks, you notice how black the background got. And so this is it locked, and you can see the arms, you can see the uh, uh, mirrors shaking around a little bit, and it stays locked for, uh, at that time, a couple of minutes, when without the stabilization of the yaw and pitch and so forth, we couldn't hold it longer than that. Eventually, we could hold it much longer than that, and then we're limited by other things. And this locking was all done in this uh, sequence semi-automatically using the uh, uh, calculations and the scheme that Matt Evans uh, developed and talked about here. One of the hard things is just looking at this scale here. This is one of his plots, is that you start with a power that's on this scale 10 to the minus 3 and end up with a power up here that's almost 10. So you have got quite a few orders of magnitude of power buildup. And in order to see it down here, in the beginning especially, we turn up all our amplifiers and everything so we can see the beam when it's not locking because we're having triple locking. And then all this has to build up and somehow stay reasonably linear. And all these, mag these uh, mirrors have on them four actuators. And you can imagine when things become nonlinear, they don't each saturate exactly the same. One 
one of the little magnets saturates before another one. And so that then it kind of goes out of lock in some funny way. So that's the kind of thing that does this. But it's a very hard job to get this completely to lock because it's a, it's a very large dynamic range and it's also nonlinear. So it's a control system with both uh, nonlinearities and a very large uh, range. This is the sensitivity that we achieved uh, during uh, our test run in January or December and January. These are the three different interferometers. The four kilometer had just been turned on at that time. And this is the Livingston four kilometer, which is better at low frequencies because we've concentrated on low frequencies because there's external reasons that, it, that we need to there. And this is the two kilometer at Hanford. I think I better quit soon. Let me just, because uh, I'm running over. Uh, this is just how far we have to go. So you can see where we are compared to where we have to go. And uh, we haven't yet really started to concentrate on sensitivity. We've worked up through that run on making these things stable. Now that we've achieved that, we can now keep it stable for hours, basically. We've already improved it another factor of three or four in the, the weeks that followed. So um, I think I'll quit. There were a few more things I was going to show, but I think I'll, I'll quit here. Okay. The option. This one or the other one? Okay, so that's where you were in January. Yeah, right. The next one is basically a curve of something like three or four. Yeah, right. So it's it's this curve down to about here. So at the higher frequencies, we're a couple orders of magnitude away at this point. At the lower frequencies, it's it's more than three orders of magnitude away. What's the limiting noise source of high frequencies? Uh, we're not sure exactly, but we're not shot noise limited yet, so we're we're not sure what the. Okay, so that, that slope that looks like shot noise limited. Yeah. Yeah, you know, everything has that shape at high frequencies because the sampling gets shorter. That's just the natural shape that anything that's flat will have. What's the source of this noise? Most of our noise now is, is in the details of the control system or electronics or pickup from the environment, meaning uh, acoustic noise, things like that that get back into the system. So, for example, we had uh, earlier we had quite a bit of noise that was in the laser system because the laser all those that fancy electronics I talked about was exposed and any sort of noise a pump vibrating would make acoustic noise that shakes the table a little bit and affects you so it's all external it's not really we're not yet at the point where we're dealing with the kinds of noise that you've been talking about in here we're just not there yet it's electronic of various types and acoustic and all the things that are just experimental problems. Once we get down near here, then we're, then we're dealing with those, but we're not there yet. Well, can you expect that LIGO will be ready to detect a gravitational wave then? Theoretically, if we could hear a big announcement, we found something. Uh, I think the first really, well, the way we've looked at it is the, the run that we're going to have we're going to have a run this summer, which is about the same as that thing I called an engineering run, which is we consider an upper limit run. That doesn't mean no one will search, but it means it's kind of not the goal. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have one more in late fall that we call an upper limit run. Those runs should be the most sensitive instrument that's actually ever looked, even though it isn't very sensitive. So we'll do that next summer, not this coming summer, but the following summer, then we expect to enter into something like a six-month run at whatever sensitivity we're at at that point, which probably won't be designed, but we'll be getting closer. And that's the first chance, I think, to look, although you know we're not at our limit yet. Is it summer of 2003, you think? Well, six months of 2003, summer of 2003, six months of data taking, and then however long it takes you to digest it. So that's the first actual actual try. 
This is our first uh, astronomical observation, actually. <laughs> Just that we can actually detect the sun and the Earth. Better than CERN. They, they do it by looking at the mass of the, the effect of the mass of the Z, actually. Wow. Yeah, by the fact that it stretches a little bit. But in, in this case, this is the uh, sh long-term stretching of the Earth by the passage of the moon and the, Earth, and the sun. Uh, there's two curves on here. One is the data. Uh, and the other is the prediction. The prediction was done the summer before we managed to lock the interferometer by a Caltech undergraduate surf student. And he did a pretty good job. He mapped the sun and the earth. You know, if there's a few places where you're off by 20% or so, but it's pretty close. So he managed to give us a model that will work. We only recently, in this, after running for about six months with the interferometer, this thing, which takes about every couple hours, it depends where the sun and the moon is, but something like a couple hours before it stretches the interferometer enough or squashes it enough so that it's outside of our range and we lose lock. And we're now actually putting in the feed forward, feedback feed forward uh, compensation for this and uh, managing to lock longer. But how does it compare with the system measurement? Which measurement? How does the LIGO measurement for some of this motion compare with the other existing measurements? Uh, yeah, we, we used a, the thing that there's on an absolute scale, uh, we're within 20% of, he used a model that's known from what, and it's within, it, what the big uncertainty is the crust of the earth itself, and how much it actually stretches and squashes. This is, has a slight cheat, we renormalized to 20% the calculation that he had. So the actual geology of the earth at Hanford where this was done is probably a little bit different, but the features are, are the same. I haven't seen better a better graph than that. I haven't looked very hard, but I haven't seen a better graph of the Earth tides than the one we've got, actually. Yeah, the best one. <laughs> best one I've seen. I don't know if it's the best one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, are right, somebody going to talk about data analysis yeah, later? Good. Yeah, good. Good. Because that's what I was going to show a little bit. But. Okay.